Abbott, Mr. Recognized for his questions. Yes, sir, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Appreciate all uh, you witnesses. What a fascinating uh, topic. And, um, Dr. Shin, uh, is the United States maintaining its leadership role in the growing and evolving market for this, the aviation market? With regard, with regard to urban air mobility, will we be first to launch operations or might we lose out to some other country? And if so, what nation and what are the consequences of not being first? Well, thank you for the question. Um, I think it, it is uh, fair to say, and I, I do believe that the United States still is leading the, uh, um, this new potential market and capability uh, from that perspective because as I said uh, in the oral testimony, we have the best minds and best technologies and best uh, entrepreneurial uh, spirit. However, um, I, I even coined, I made up an uh, English word called the most developed country syndrome. So we, we are the most developed country in the world. And um, along with that, we have a lot of interest that some, some other countries may not care that much, or they uh, will be willing to relax some of those concerns. So um, the name of the game in this area, in my view, is uh, entry, since entry cost is very low compared to uh, regular uh, commercial airline business. Um, uh, most, probably most uh, developed countries or developing countries can actually uh, start this industry if they are willing to uh, lower or relax the uh, constraints and issues um, from regulatory perspective, some safety perspective, and so on. So that is, that is indeed a concern. And um, as you all know, uh, some of the countries are jumping ahead and uh, allowing even U.S. companies go to their, those countries. Who are those countries? Uh, there, there are Australia, New Zealand, and some of the European countries are willing to do that, and Singapore also. So some of the Countries, uh, again, I'm, I'm not suggesting they are lowering the safety standard, but they're willing to okay. uh, jump ahead. So that is, uh, uh, that is a concern. But I do believe uh, we have the, still the way to uh, scale this up, as Dr. Allison and Dr. Okay. Uh, Ms. Dietrich uh, talked about. Thank you. Uh, once the UAM system is in place and multiple options exist for people to travel by air taxi, uh, how long will it take before people will be able to own and operate their own veto vehicles? Uh, you may have already touched on this a little bit. I had to leave the room. Uh, and how much more complicated will it be to manage the, the, the do the air traffic control management, um, Ms. Dietrich? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I, I think that many of us in the space are not anticipating a private ownership model for the vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. I think we're seeing those as uh, probably being cost prohibitive. Uh, for an individual owner, um, as well as uh, if the system works the way envisioned, it won't be necessary. You'll be able to get the functionality without the headache and without the upfront expense. Right. Um, so I do expect that these vehicles will be uh, really dramatically increasing the number of aircraft that we see in the general aviation industry. I mean, just my company alone is, is looking at deliveries on the order of a few thousand a year. That's currently basically the entire size of the GA industry each year. So uh, this, this industry will rapidly become more of the norm uh, than what we see in, in legacy aircraft today. And I think we're going to have to be conscious of that as we think about new constructs of both ownership and usage of these vehicles in that what folks typically think of as small airplanes and general aviation today will become a small piece of a uh, much larger industry uh, that brings uh, the benefits of transportation by small aircraft to many more people, but is not what we currently think of. Okay, thank you. And uh, Mr. McNerney uh, had touched on this a little while ago, but just to be more specific, cybersecurity is a topic of serious concern uh, whenever we discuss technologies, especially those that are new and nascent. Uh, how will the veto vehicles be protected from cybersecurity attacks and who will be responsible for that protection? Will it be the vehicle manufacturer, uh, the company that runs the operating system, the FAA, or someone else? And who would like to uh, respond to that? Dr. Clark. Sure. <laughs> I'm a faculty member, you know, we also. <laughs> right. Uh, so, so precedence um, is that the operators ultimately are going to be the ones that are responsible. Um, I'll give you a quick example. 
every 28 days, we update the database of waypoints in the country that goes into the flight management system. And even though the person putting it in might actually make a mistake, if something happens, it's the operator, the airline, that's responsible because sure. they need to check. So they actually have staff members checking that database every 28 days. So that's what precedent would suggest. Ultimately, it's going to be a partnership. The one thing about aviation is that it truly has been and will continue to be a partnership between regulators, operators, and manufacturers. And um, there, like I said, there are work, people doing work, which I can't talk about, on, on the cybersecurity um, issue. Uh, but they're, but they're, they're going to be, it's going to be a partnership, and people are going to basically figure out how to, to do some tests of things coming in and out. Uh, communications is one thing. There are companies thinking about using in-flight entertainment systems for doing communications of flight-critical information. There are people working on how to do that and keeping track of whether there's been nefarious <coughs> Um, tampering with the with the, okay. with the data, et cetera. Okay, thank you very much. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr.